Here's what's coming up on today's show. We tell retirees, like your holding period as a retiree is 25 to 30 years. And we want you to get the 10 best days of the stock market Mm -hmm. over the next 10 years, let's say. So in order for us to get those 10 best days. You're going to be in when it's not the best days. You're going to have have some loser days. Right. We have to stay invested. This is the Money Master Podcast from Brindle and Bay Wealth Management with Tori Tenhagen, Connie Davis, and certified financial planner, Nick Davis. All right, welcome back to the Money Master Podcast. This is the book club edition for The Psychology of Money. Morgan Housel is the author. Today, we're gonna go over chapters five and six. This has been a lot of fun. If you haven't listened to the other chapters, you might wanna go and find those either on uh, the YouTube playlist or on your podcast playlist. Okay, so chapter five, I'm here with Connie and Tori. And we are, we, we got our books out and we've got our highlighters out and the chapter is called getting wealthy versus staying wealthy. I think we all have heard stories about that. And, um, we all here, we're here to stay wealthy, right? We're here to become people who graduate from our work into our next chapter. And we need to be able to stay wealthy to do that. And there's plenty of stories of great returns and great tragedy Mm -hmm. that we can go off of from this chapter. And um, I really enjoyed this chapter because it really is two completely different things. Getting wealthy takes one skill set and then staying wealthy takes a whole nother skill set. I mean, we've all heard those stories of now the book didn't talk about this, but someone who wins the lottery, right? And then all of a sudden they're broke again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like what in the world? How that yeah, well, just And you feel like you hear that more often than not about yeah. people who win it. Like they don't, they don't keep <clears throat> right. it. They don't know how to manage it. Well, and the, <clears throat> the chapter, it starts off by saying good investing is not necessarily about making good decisions. It's about consistently not screwing up. And I think that's <laughs> funny that it said consistently not screwing up yeah. because we're all going to screw up. Right, yeah. we, you can't get it right a hundred percent of the time. So yeah. it, just not well, consistently just screwing up. More often than not, don't yes. screw up. We tell people a lot of times. We'll say our job is to keep you from making the big mistake. Like, what is the big mistake? That is moving all your money to cash at the wrong time, freaking out, ma- yeah. making adjustments during the middle of an election. Well, and the first page says there's only one way to stay wealthy: a combination of frugality and paranoia. And I think there's yeah. there's a clarification yep. there when we say we don't want you to panic and move to cash. Yeah. That's one thing. Having the paranoia and wisdom to say, should I be worried? That's different. Yeah. It's not making the decision to panic and actually do something crazy. It's asking the questions and having the fear is somewhat wise to feel out your world around you and say what's going on. Yeah. So there's a th- but to yeah. not panic and make crazy rash decisions. Right. Well, there's the theme in this chapter and that theme is you know, you have to take risks to get to make money. Even if that risk is just you going out to work and facing traffic every day, mm-hmm. or if it's risk because you're an entrepreneur, but then there's this paradox where you're also having to be cautious and be a survivalist, being paranoid. And that's, it's like two opposing things to be optimistic and then also paranoid at the same time. So this book, this, this chapter starts off with talking about October of 1929 the week whose days were later named as Black Monday, Black Tuesday, and Black Thursday. And what happens is it talks about two different investors. One guy was named Livermore, and he was a successful trader. And he actually was trading before it was actually a thing. So he was a really good trader. And when what happened was his wife was at home and his wife's mother was at home and they found out that the market had crashed so horribly and they were crying. Livermore walks in the door And he says, why are you crying? Like, I had a suspicion this was going to happen and I shorted the market. And so I had my best trading day ever. And he made like with the equivalent of like, I think it was something like $34 billion or something in a day. It was a crazy amount of money that he made in a day. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was something like that. And so they compare it 1929, same time period, another guy, we all can relate to this other guy. And he basically had been really, really bullish on stocks, lost everything. And in the news, it reported that he had, you know, gone missing. And the suspicion is, is that he, he never came back because, you know, we know what happened during the Great Depression and the stock market crash. So what happens in this story is you see these two different types of investors, right? Well, four years later, the guy who had shorted the market did really, really well. He was going nuts on leverage. He was, he was overconfident. 
and he lost everything. And I mean everything. He disappears. His wife reaches out. The newspapers say the great investor that we all heard about is gone, missing. You know, he shows back up two days later. He didn't hurt himself, but it set the stage because eventually he did. Uh, eventually he did because of that. And so it's a tragedy. You know, it's, it's a tragedy to hear the story about the ability to take risk. And the idea here is, you know, to keep it is more important. And it says that um, the Forbes 400 list of richest Americans has on average roughly 20% turnover per decade for causes that don't have to do with death or transferring money to another family member, which means people don't keep their money. You know, in general, people don't keep their money. Getting money is one thing, but keeping it is another. Well, it also reminds me of the previous chapter where we're talking about, you know, constantly, or like how much is enough, you know, and moving the goalpost. Um, so being content and finding out, you know, figuring out what can I do to not keep moving the goalpost and having bigger, bigger dreams that I'm going to keep spending money. Yeah. You know, there's, you do have to find a place of being frugal and a little bit of fear of, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to lose what I now have. Yeah. Um, you know, keeping money requires the opposite of taking risks. It said, the book says it requires humility, the fear that what you've made can be taken away from you just as fast. It requires frugality and an acceptance that at least some of what you've made is attributable to luck. So past yeah. success can't be relied upon to repeat indefinitely. Yeah. So fear. So meaning... There's a part of you that starts, I, I relate this to starting a business. When you start a business, a lot of times people start them on credit cards. Mm -hmm. They get very successful. And that same crazy risk taker as you have employees who are depending upon you mm -hmm. cannot continue to operate that way. So they have to shift gears and become a little more uh, survival minded. So the solution here, the book talks about is survival. It says, Michael uh, Moritz, the billionaire head of Sequoia Capital was asked by Charlie Rose, why Sequoia was so successful. And, you know, he mentioned how a lot of these VC firms, uh, they don't really survive. And how did you prosper for so long? And his answer was, I think I've always been afraid of going out of business. So Rose says, really? So it's fear? Only the paranoid survive? And he says, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that, right? We can't believe that what got us here is going to keep us here. So survival is the name of the game, right? We, we have to... Um, kind of have to know where we have to hedge ourselves to be okay. Well, that's exactly, that's, again, from the previous chapter, that's the Madoff situation. No one to stop. You've yeah. made it. Like yeah. you said, like starting a yeah. business that you can't continue to be that right. risky person. You've made it. Now, now cause this to continue thriving. Right. And, and from our last chapter, we talked about one of the ways to get wealth more uh, soundly is through compounding, which you know, is a miracle and it takes time, right? Rather than, you know, this one stock, this penny stock, this, there's so many people going for broke, you know, they put, they buy hope, they buy into something that's, they're not thinking soundly because, you know, everybody's on the bandwagon for this thing or their group of people who want to believe a certain thing are on the bandwagon, right? And they're not thinking soundly because they're ultimately, they're buying hope. They're not listening to sound advice. Well, and then you go back to what we just opened up this episode with. What if that does work out that one time? Yeah. But, you know, you short the stock market in the Great Depression, you still end up unhappy right. four years later. Right. Mm -hmm. And making mistakes. So we know that the solution is to be paranoid, right? And so I'm going to read, uh, there's one, two, three, maybe four. No, there's three points here that the author gives us. So number one, he says, more than I want big returns, I want to be financially unbreakable. And if I'm unbreakable, I actually think I'll get the biggest returns because I'll be able to stick around long enough for compounding to work wonders. Okay. And I love what he says. He says, no one wants to hold cash during a bull market. So when the market's going up, you feel like an idiot for holding cash. Okay. Because maybe let's say that cash is only earning 1% while stocks are earning 10% that year. And that 9% that gap is going to gnaw at you every day, he says. Okay. But listen to what he says. But if that cash prevents you from having to sell your stocks during a bear market, 
the actual return you earned on that cash is not 1% a year. It could be many multiples of that because preventing one desperate ill-timed stock sale can do more for your lifetime returns than picking dozens of big time winners. That's when we talk about helping you to avoid the big mistake. Yeah, we get, I mean, I think it's very easy to feel short-sighted of, well, the market's going up. I need to get all in and I need to do, but then mm -hmm. when the market's down, you panic. Like it's, it's very That's easy. That's the worst time. You've already missed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is the worst time. Yeah. Yeah. So compounding doesn't, doesn't rely on earning big returns, merely good returns sustained uninterrupted for the longest period of time, especially in times of chaos and havoc will always win. That was the first point. And I, I like the second survival mindset. Okay, go it's, ahead. Planning is important, but the most important part of every plan is to plan on the plan, not going according to plan. That's how I live my life. That's my life motto. Prepare for it all. Like, yeah. Have a plan, prepare, but no, it's probably not going to go the that, way you I mean, think. But if you, we've, we have a podcast on this, that's one of our financial planning principles. We plan yeah. for what can go wrong yeah. and, and we say the course. That's we right. know there's stuff that's going to go wrong. Right. So when you, you plan all your cash flows for the next 20 years and your returns and everything you want to have happen and inflation and everything, you and then when know. real life happens, yeah. what's happened, you know, well, in 2000, you know, we, we go through 2001, we go through 9-11, we go through 20 years of stuff that we never thought would happen. The housing boom that caused nearly 10 million Americans to lose their home, a financial crisis that almost 9 million people lost their jobs and record-breaking stock market rally that ensued for the next... 14 plus years. And then we had the coronavirus that happened. Shh, we don't say that word All yet. during, yeah, we don't talk about that. <laughs> I'm so sick of that word. <laughs> but, it, you know, and, and so a plan is only useful as if it can survive what really happens. And the unknown is going to happen, right? So we have to be aware, plan that our plan is not going to go according to plan. One of the things that we do here is when you start to take income for retirement is we look backwards at memorable times and we say, well, if you were to go through 14 amazing years, like 2009 plus, then here's what would it look like? It would look like. However, if you were to start in 1970 and we go through really bad stagflation, okay, well, why don't we prepare for that? Meaning what if we prepare for the worst potential time period? And if you know you're going to be okay then, right, then you can feel good about your plan because if it goes better, well, great. But right. let's be planning for the potential for it to not go so well. Well, and he compares, you know, because we do, we have people who come in here, I just want to be super conservative. I don't want to lose money. You know that he compares the difference in being conservative, like which is avoiding a level of risk versus a margin of safety. Yeah. Which is one where you, you know, you have a frugal budget, you have flexible thinking, a loose timeline. Like there's things that can be moved versus just protect my money at all costs and don't take risks. Mm -hmm. Those Two things are very different and one's going to yeah. outwork That's very well other. stated. That's exactly right. Yep. The margin of safety, planning for that. Very well said. All right. The third and final point is that he says a barbelled personality, optimistic about the future, but paranoid about what will happen t between, you know, you getting to the future <laughs> is vital. So optimism is that is uh, the belief that things are going to go well. Right. But sensible optimism is the belief that even though the odds are in your favor, it's going to balance out over time. But there's going to be some there's going to be some misery in between. There's going to be some things that happen that are going to try to set you off course. But ultimately, you believe in the the ultimate good. Right. That's that's optimism. So it's such a contradiction. Right. To be optimistic, but also paranoid. Right. I, I would view myself that way, like the way that we started Brindle and Bay. We were optimistic, but we're also being very conservative, like very overly cautious with cash and overly cautious with bringing on new team members, you know, because being aware of where that margin of safety is with your, your cash flows. Right. So I can relate to it from that perspective. Silence. Yeah. We're all, we're all flipping to the next few pages. There's lots after that. Uh, you know, what they're looking at is they're looking, they're, they're looking at page 65 when There's it talks about stats, the yeah. real GDP per capita sh from 1850 to 2010. And it shows you know, everything goes up and to the right, but it shows these squiggly lines, these drawdowns in between. And what's such a paradox is that ultimately things are going up, but we're facing all of these things that say it's going down. Well, yeah, the very next page lists many bullet points of really hard things that happened during those time periods. Yeah. So read it. what are a couple of them? 1.3 million Americans died while fighting nine major wars. 
Uh, 99.9% of all companies that were created went out of business. Four U.S. presidents were assassinated. Uh, stocks lost a third of their value at least 12 times. Annual oh. inflation exceeded 7% in 20 separate years. So there's lots. I mean, but if you look back at their graph, you're like, oh, yeah, we did well. <laughs> I like the last one. <laughs> the words economic pessimism appeared in newspapers at least 29,000 times, according to Google. We hear that all the time because that's what, that's what sells, right? Yeah. So our standard of living increased 20-fold in these 170 years that Tori just read those horrible things happen, right? Barely a day went by that lacked tangible reasons for pessimism. A mindset that can be paranoid and optimistic at the same time is hard to maintain because seeing things as black or white takes less effort than accepting nuance. But you need short-term paranoia to keep you alive long enough to exploit long-term optimism. I love that. Short-term paranoia to keep you alive long enough to exploit long-term optimism. Hey, Nick Davis here. You know, we have a vision to create a rewarding, fulfilling retirement journey for every individual. And we do that through creating well-thought-out financial plans. Now, if you want to create the next chapter experience filled with calmness and clarity for your life, then our team would love to visit with you about that. It all starts with a 15-minute discovery call that you can set up right there on your phone or your computer. All you have to do is click on the Let's Talk button that's on our website, brindleandbay.com. So you'll go to brindleandbay.com and click Let's Talk. Let's get the conversation started with a short phone call. We would welcome an opportunity to meet you. All right. That was chapter five. Let's go, moving on to chapter six for this episode. Tales you win. You can be wrong half the time and still make a fortune. I love That's this good. principle. Yeah. You can be wrong half the time and still make a fortune. That's okay. encouraging, right? So we all, when we were flipping through, we all liked the quote at the beginning. Uh, it's from Brad Pitt at the Screen Actors Guild Award says, I've been banging away at this thing for 30 years. I think the simple math is some projects work and some don't. There's no reason to belabor either one. Just get on to the next. Yeah, I like that. And I mean, I, I feel like we see evidence of that even now, like doing a review period with our members. And we just went through some really tough stock market years and nobody yeah. is still stuck there. We're like, okay, yeah. we're still moving forward. Yeah. Like, it doesn't let that short term thinking we talked about, it doesn't right. last. You you do move forward. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so the chapter talks about art dealers, and I think that this is very interesting. So it talks about there was this one art deal dealer that had so much art when he sold it to Germany for like a hundred million dollars, they viewed that as a donation because it was worth billions of dollars. And to be a good art dealer, it says that they actually operated like index funds. So index funds are like, you know, mutual funds, ETFs, exchange traded funds. They bought everything they could and they bought it in portfolios, not individual pieces that they happened to like. And then they sat and waited for a few winners to emerge. Meaning when you buy art, it's so subjective. You don't know what the world is going to say as garbage and what the world is going to say as a masterpiece. So what do great, great art collectors do? They buy everything strategically and then there's a couple of things that really, really work out. And it works that way inside of index funds and mutual funds and ETFs, right? There's, there's a, a little, there's a few companies pulling a lot of weight, but the, the safety is in having the diversification, right? The, it would be crazy to just try to buy those handful of companies that are doing all of the work. So you can be right, you can be wrong half the time and still make a fortune, it's kind of like that show, that Storage Wars, you know, on TV, where <laughs> yeah, where they go and they, and they are cleaning out these storage bins. And you never know what you're going to find mm -hmm. in there. Like half of it, more than half of it could be junk. junk yeah. But you have like two or five things. You're like, oh, score. I know. Win. Yeah. yeah that's that exactly right. So he talks about Walt Disney and how Steamboat Willie was their big thing. But then they had so many films that did not work out. They were wasting crazy amount of expensive financing until they got Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and that changed everything. But that's eight years. Yeah, and it was a between nineteen thirty and nineteen thirty eight. He was just plugging away, right? Not right. making that big thing. Mm -hmm. right. More than four hundred cartoons. Right. So the author's point here is the tales. The tale drives everything, right? It's that thing. The tale drives everything. So J.P. Morgan, 
Asset Management once published the distribution of returns for the Russell 3000 Index, a big, broad collection of public companies since 1980. 40% of all Russell 3000 stock components lost at least 70% of their value and never recovered over this period. Effectively, all of the index's overall returns came from 7% of component companies that outperformed by at least two standard deviations. So you can win less than half the time, and, and that's the point, right? So there's, there's a graph that I'm looking at, and it says there's a percentage of companies that experienced catastrophic loss. And this is why I think it's important for you to also be willing to fail a lot of times, whether in life or in your investments, because, you know, the winners are going to be what, where that safety is, that, that wisdom is. So since 1980 to 2015, 57% of technology stocks experienced a catastrophic loss, 57%, 51% of telecom, 47% of energy, 43% of consumer discretionary, 42% of healthcare, and then I'll kind of just go all the way to the very end, 13% of utilities. So the point is, these are companies that just disappeared. Just because it's a publicly traded company doesn't mean it's, it's going to be okay. Right. Right. You have to have diversification. Okay. And uh, the author says, the interesting thing here is that you have to have achieved a certain level of success to become a public company and a member of the Russell 3000. You know, these are established corporations, not fly-by-night startups. Even still, most of them have lifespans measured in years, not generations. And he says, the most important part of the story is that the Russell 3000 has increased more than 73-fold since 1980. Okay, that's success. That's a spectacular return. 40% of the companies in the index were effectively failures. But the 7% of companies that performed extremely well were more than enough to offset the duds. Yeah. So we can, I mean, we can fail yeah, and the, be all right. The chapter gives story after story about, you know, tales you win. Like so many things go wrong. There's so many duds. It even talks about Amazon, right? Like they lost a ton of money on the Fire Phone. I didn't even know they tried to do a Fire Phone. Like yeah. poured in tons of money and it was a dud. But guess what? Really doesn't matter because Amazon Web Services earns billions, you know, to make up for that. Yeah. Or, or an actor, you know, they... They do a film, they think it's going to be great, and it totally duds. But guess what? They do another film, and it's amazing. Like, Well, and you can even see that in, in returns in the stock market. There are years where all of the return for a year comes in just a few days. Right. You you lost, effectively, most of the days right. of the year. Right. But if you were in those three to five to seven days where the returns came from, you still won. We tell retirees, like, your holding period as a retiree is 25 to 30 years. And we want you to get the 10 best days of the stock market mm -hmm. over the next 10 years, let's say. So in order for us to get those 10 best days. You're going to be in when it's not the best days. Yeah, we You're have to stay have invested. loser days. Right. We have to yeah. stay invested. They quote Napoleon, the war leader. Napoleon's definition of military genius was the man who can do the average thing when all, th all those around him are going crazy. And Morgan, the author, says it's the same in investing. Most financial advice is about today. What should you do right now? And what stocks look good buys today? But most of the time, today is not that important, right? It's about the lifetime of your investing experience, keeping that big picture mm -hmm. in mind. Yeah, that's just counterintuitive to that, where yeah. we are in today, where that right. now mindset. So I'm going to read a story that I, th and I want you to help me clarify this if it's not clear, because it, the book goes into talking about three different types of investors. And I want to clarify this for you all. So I think this will be very helpful for our listeners. It, it's just a great principle about stock market investing. So you could invest that $1 into the U.S. stock market every month, rain or shine. It doesn't matter if economists are screaming about a looming recession or a bear market. You just keep investing. Let's call that investor who does this, Sue. Okay, so investor number one is named Sue. But maybe investing during a recession is too scary. So perhaps you invest your $1 in the stock market when the economy is not in a recession. You sell everything when it is in a recession and save your monthly dollar in cash and invest everything back into the stock market when the recession ends. We'll call this investor Jim. So that's the second investor. Or perhaps it takes a few months for a recession to scare you out and then it takes you a while to regain confidence before you get back in the market. 
So you invest $1 in stocks when there's no recession. You sell six months after recession begins and invest back in six months after a recession ends. We're going to call you Tom. So that's investor number three. Does that make sense? Yeah. All three investors have different behaviors about the market. One of them stays committed to their plan. The other one kind of tries to time the market. So how much money would these three investors end up with over time? Well, Sue, investor number one, ends up with $435,000. And she was the one that stayed in $1 the market. $1 a month. Yep. Stayed. Mm -hmm. Jim has $257,000 and Tom has $234,000. So Sue wins by a mile. Okay. So that's the moral of the story there. Stay invested. Stay the course. Stay the course during those good and bad times. It's very, very, it's mind game. It really is difficult because there's so many down periods. There's so much bad media out there to distract you. But we have to accept that the tail drives everything in business, in investing, in finance. And when you realize that it's normal for lots of things to go wrong, to break, to fail, and to fall. So yeah. Well, and I liked the section where it says there's an old pilot clip that their jobs are hours and hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. <laughs> it's the same in investing. Your success as an investor will be determined by how you respond to punctuated moments of terror, not the years you spend on cruise control. Yeah. Yeah. Another memorable story as we close this out, talks about Chris Rock. And Chris Rock, you know, he looks flawless on his Netflix episodes or when he's in, on tour in front of everybody. But it says that he, he performs in dozens of small clubs each year um, by design, and he has jokes that don't land well, meaning he stands in front of people with a notebook and literally in front of the crowd says, I'm throwing that one out. And so we've all, there's a show called The Ma Marvelous Madam. Miss Mar Mar Marvelous Miss Maisel. Miss yeah. Maisel. And I think it was Lenny. In Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce, who was standing there with a notebook, and they were just rehearsing in front of a crowd at these small clubs. So that when you see them on stage, that's just the very best of what you see, yeah. meaning they've refined that out so much. And um, I think when we hear stories about people who did really, really well in something, and either they got lucky or they refined the heck out of it just to get to that point, right? And so we have to kind of un, you know, destigmatize this idea of winning all the time, right? I think the moral of the story here is you're not going to get it perfectly right. You know, especially with retirement planning, people, just, they're, they're, they're on Zoom with us or they're in the office, you know, and they're like, I got to get this right. This is so important. I got to get it right. And you're right. You got to get certain things right, but you don't have to be perfect, right? You just have to get more things right than you get wrong, right? And you have to be okay with knowing that you're going to, you know, that you're losing. Now, you don't want to think about losing money in the stock market, but you're, there's going to be losers, mm -hmm. right? And that's the hard thing especially with rebalancing. With rebalancing, it's the craziest thing ever. You're selling winners to buy losers, right? So when I think about that, it's just, it's crazy. You're like, oh, wow, look at how well this is doing, but I'm going to sell it quarterly or annually or whatever the plan is to get rid of that and buy more of the stuff that hasn't been doing so well. Am I crazy? Right? That's rebalancing. But we all know the studies show that rebalancing wins the wars, right? Versus every single battle. Well, I think that's a wrap for today. We appreciate you listening and, you know, we really enjoy bringing this podcast to you. And so if you enjoy listening, leave a comment in the comment section, like, share, um, send us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, it's Nick here. I know that many of our listeners like to read books about financial planning, and I wrote a book called A Wealth of Wisdom, and in it, I share a story about my grandpa and his successful retirement. I also point out that his world, now he retired in the 1990s, his world was very different from today's retiree. There are certain things that today's retiree must do to be successful in retirement. So there's no cost for the book. All you have to do is text us the word book to our office line, and I'll get that sent over to you right away. The number is 214-988-9178. 
Again, you'll text the word BOOK to 214-988-9178. Nick Davis is an investment advisor representative of Brindle and Bay Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. This show is for informational purposes only. Any exposure to ideas and financial vehicles discussed should not be considered financial advice or recommendation to buy or sell a financial vehicle. You should consult a qualified financial, tax, or legal professional before taking any action. This program is not endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any other government agency. Annuity guarantees rely solely on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing company. Insurance licensed in Texas, number 1188639. Brindle and Bay Wealth Management is affiliated with Brindle and Bay Financial Advisors.